Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you for uh, making your way in um, and taking a shortened coffee break. Um, it's, it's a tough act to follow the, the previous panel uh, that spoke on uh, uh, disarm or uh, denuclearization and, and non-proliferation issues um, in Northeast Asia. Uh, today we're going to, uh, or at least now, we're going to focus on um, kind of the, uh, one of the emerging domains, one that's been around since 1957 when the first satellite was launched um, by the Soviet Union. <coughs> And it's a, becoming an increasingly uh, complex domain for a number of reasons. Um, some of you know that the, the U.S. has now initiated what they call the Space Force. Um, I, I think it's a rather unfortunate name. I, I wish they had picked something a little more neutral. Um, but nonetheless, it shows or demonstrates that there is um, an increasing awareness about uh, the security of space, but also an increasing importance in the, in the role it may play in military affairs going forward. Um, I think it's interesting to note that I think somewhere around 85% of the satellites that are in orbit are actually non-military or non-intelligence related. It, they're mostly commercial. Um, I think one of the other things that's very interesting, that's a major change that's occurred over the last half decade um, is space is no longer uh, strictly um, the frontier for large nation states. I mean, I can remember the days, I'm old enough to remember the days that uh, where, you know, entrance into space um, kind of granted you great power status and, uh, you know, the, the march to space, uh, I think there's, what, nine or ten officially space-faring nations. But we now have private companies, not just in the United States, but there's one in, I think it's New Zealand, um, in China, and, and other places where private enterprise has managed to uh, reach or be able to deliver satellites into space. So it's no longer just something that uh, major powers uh, are pursuing. Um, but one of the security issues related to space is, um, one could say it's very offense dominated um, it's really easy to attack a satellites. Um, it's hard to defend them. So resiliency is going to become a major issue for a lot of powers that rely on satellites, not just for military means, but also for uh, commerce, uh, you know, navigation. I think we all have GPS now in our, our smartphones, um, telecommunications, um, even cell phone communications. If they're long distance, they, the signal will travel up and down uh, from a satellite. And of course, there's the Earth observation satellites that provide us with uh, information about our weather, amongst uh, many other things that are important. Um, so at this panel, we, we hope to talk about um, some of the major issues that we face today. Um, and perhaps we can get into some discussion about the governance uh, of, of space, um, how things could be regulated. Um, and perhaps um, what can be done to prevent the, <coughs> what I'll call the weaponization of space, and that, that definition depends on how you define weaponization, of course, um, but I'm thinking of actually placing kinetic um, capabilities in space to attack either other satellites or things that are flying through the Earth's atmosphere or above the Earth's atmosphere, um, namely missile defense, type assets, um, or, or satellites that perform other uh, kinetic action. Uh, we have five speakers today. I'm going to very briefly introduce them. Um, you can look uh, through the material that was provided uh, to, to get a longer um, or a deeper dive into their, um, their biographies. Um, first, we have Ajay Zetlely. Um, is a senior fellow at the Institute of Defense Studies and Analysis in New Delhi. Um, Alexandra uh, Sticklings from the research, or is a research fellow at the Royal um, United Services Institute in London. Um, on the agenda, um, Karen Clays was, was uh, intended to be here, uh, but has been replaced uh, by Peter Havlick. 
uh, who is on the Space Task Force with the European External Action Services. I should note that Peter has to catch a plane at, and leave at 4.30, so I'm going to give him the floor first. Uh, so when, when he suddenly disappears during the session, please don't be shocked. It's, he's, not, uh, he's not reacting to a question from the audience or a statement from the chair or anything um, of that nature. Um, excuse me. Okay. Um, and then further to my left is Ma Shengyu. Shengyu? Uh, well, I'll let you pronounce that. I'm... I, Okay. Uh, okay, yes, but he's the Deputy Director General, uh, the Department of Arms Control at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Beijing. And last but not least, we have Javier Pasco, who's the Director at the um, FRS in Paris. I'm not going to destroy the French language also. Um, who will go? We're going to start with, um, with Peter, and then we'll resume on down the line uh, uh, in the order that I introduced uh, folks. So Peter, without further ado, I want to hand the floor over to you. Uh, thank you, thank you, Michael. So, so much for for interaction. Uh, first of all, uh, I, I apologize, Madame Madame Karin Kleis, uh, the EU Special Envoy for Space. She has some unexpected uh, co commitment, so it will be my 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 privilege to to replace her her today. I am from the the Space Task Force, and I do uh, UN. UN matters, space law, space security, and such such uh, thing. And let me also thank the EU Non-Proliferation and Disarmament Consortium for organizing this and for inviting us to this uh, Im important uh, meeting. You know, the the EU, its member states, and uh, the European Space Agency uh, together have uh, developed strong and unique uh, space capacities and and industry, the EU now has a large budget for, for space, most of which is now dedicated to, to European global navigation satellite systems, which are Galileo and EGNOS, and uh, to the European Earth Observation System, which is called now, now Copernicus. Um, uh, we are about to, to adopt a space program for uh, 2021 to 2027 to boost the EU space uh, capabilities in the fields of three fields, navigation, earth observation, space situation awareness, and governmental satellite communication. These last two, two components are, are, are relatively new. Uh, uh, for us. Uh, therefore, it is certainly our prime interest to have uh, space environment with high level of safety, security and uh, sustainability also for our space, space assets. Uh, we, we continuously promote the preservation of a safe, secure and sustainable space environment and the peaceful use of outer space on an equitable and mutually accepted uh, basis. And we, we certainly stress the importance of transparency and confidence building measures and the need to, to advocate responsible behavior in outer space in the framework of, of the United Nations. We, as the EU, and this is, this is well known, we strongly support the multilateralism, multilateralism, multilateral approach, and the United Nations. And we, we always uh, highlight that uh, COPUOS and its subcommittees are unique international platforms for international cooperation in space, including on the development of international norms and standards regulating space activities. Um, in this respect, we, we really express our satisfaction that this year the space community made um, an important step and that uh, COPUOS adopted the preamble and uh, 21 long-term sustainability guidelines uh, COPUOS proved that uh, multilateral space diplomacy can uh, can work and uh, produces uh, uh, results and you who was involved in these matters uh, know uh, that it was really not not easy and it 
took almost almost 10 years. Uh, COPO's uh, LTS guidelines are certainly important contribution to the transparency and uh, confidence building measures. Uh, in terms of, uh, our, of the arms control, the EU and its member states again remain uh, strongly committed to the prevention of an arms race in, uh, outer, in outer space. We are concerned about the continued development of anti-satellite weapons and cap capabilities, including Earth-based. Uh, we have recently highlighted this in our statements at the, at the UN General Assembly this autumn. Uh, we, we call on all states to, to refrain from destruction of space objects that generate space debris, notably multiple long-lived uh, debris. Uh, we are of the opinion that we need certainly to, to foster international cooperation and to establish principles of responsible behavior and uh, sustainability of outer, uh, outer space activities. If uh, we, we look at, and at the enormous technological development, the, the rapidly growing number of human activities in space and the increasingly diverse nature of space operators, we mean both governmental and, and private uh, ones, as it was already, already mentioned by Michael, it has become very, very urgent to develop new relevant rules uh, and norms within the UN, uh, UN uh, framework. We say that uh, certainly a legally, legally binding instrument could be an option. However, we are realistic and we believe that the most realistic near-term prospect lies in agreeing on a voluntary instrument, on voluntary uh, norms. Uh, such a voluntary instrument could establish the, the standards of responsible behavior across the, the full range of space activities and related uh, challenges, such as, for example, the, the intentional creation, the mitigation and the remediation of space debris, which is particularly par partially caused by, by international intentional anti-satellite weapon testing and the conduct of proximity operations and coordination of collision avoidance, which are the, the, the examples which could, be, which could be tackled to promote the security and safety in outer space in an, as we say, a integrated uh, fashion. Uh, the idea, uh, certainly the, the idea of a voluntary instrument is not to replace, but to, to complement the, the COPUOS long-term sustainability guidelines. And um, a voluntary instrument could include a political commitment by the states and to create a more structural cooperative, uh, cooperative framework. And the, the, the compliance with existing international law as well as with transparency and confidence building measures as developed um, again in, in the UN, UN framework would have to be ensured. Um, we, in this respect, we launched the, the public diplomacy initiative in September this year in, uh, in Paris to arts uh, to policymakers, industry, think tanks, and academia, and space space agency, and also to the towards the scientific community throughout the world, in order to raise uh, awareness and build um, something like common common understanding on the need to act swiftly and jointly for sustainable outer outer space. Uh, the the this such a common understanding should concretize in technical norms or and and standards uh, defined by the relevant actors and to pave pave the way for a political political commitment. 
we call our initiative 3SOS. 3S like security, safety, sustainability, and SOS to, un to underline the, the urgency of the situation and need for a move, move ahead. This week on 9th of December, the EU Proliferation and Disarmament Consortium and particularly uh, Fondation pour la Research Strategic uh, organized the seminar on, on this issue of the space security, safety and sustainability here in Brussels. It was really very interesting. And I would again like to thank <laughs> Xavier for his, his work. Uh, just a very, very briefly on the, on the result, uh, this seminar, and this was our intention, put together the governmental officials, academics, and the private sector. And we have really very, very open, open and fruitful uh, discussion. Seminar was very well received and very well appreciated because we put together, um, say, space community and non-proliferation uh, community because it's we think that it's very important that these communities co communicate uh, each each other. Mm, just some some short short summaries. Uh, the the issue of a global regulation is a real question for for today. If we again, if you look at the technical technical. Development. We do do not have so we, we don't have so so much time for an action or or actions and uh, private sector operators and analysts draw our attention to the fact that an action is needed more more urgently than uh, what we initially initially uh, thought. So we, we need a global com, common uh, and uh, certainly multilateral solution <coughs> and, and we need it uh, very, very timely. It was also highlighted uh, that space operators must be involved in the, in the negotiation process. Uh, we, we have to learn from the from the private uh, sector, which is more and more involved in in space space uh, matters. Uh, it was also underlined that we have to keep the communication channels open and to discuss, especially the space security related issues, openly, even if there are different views. For example, on ballistic missiles issues, which are very complicated part of this of this uh, sector. Um, so we we now really really face uh, the the situation that uh, space is not an infinity resource, at least uh, in the in the low Earth Earth orbit orbit due to increased current or future activities or, or, or plans to create, create large mega, mega, star, mega constellations, you know, that there is one, one project to launch uh, 12,000 uh, satellites during just few, few coming, coming years. So based on the, on the success and results of this seminar, we plan to, to continue in this in these uh, activities, uh, so we are thinking about about future steps in this uh, results. So it should be may, may, maybe maybe uh, this uh, all at this uh, stage. And Michael, thank you, thank you again, and thank you so much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you. Um, you, you bring up a, a very interesting point at the end um, about mega constellations, and I think one of the uh, innovative um, companies that, that I've seen is Planet Labs or Planet, uh, where they you know, generate a large number of small, inexpensive satellites to put up. Um, and I understand that the U.S. Department of Defense is, is examining that model as a potential for their infrared um, early warning or tracking array um, as something that might be more fruitful and uh, successful in their attempts to put up very a small number of very expensive satellites. 
but that just further congests low Earth orbit, and it's uh, an issue that um, it needs to be addressed sooner rather than later with uh, the commercial aspects of space taking over so much uh, of what we do. Um, next, I'd like to turn the floor over to Andrea. No, oh, no, AJ, I'm sorry. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Let me thank the organizers for inviting me over here. In fact, I will start uh, my talk by speaking something which I'm not going to speak. Uh, but just to carry forward the last session further, uh, can space be used for diplomacy? I think there is a strong case in case of a North Korea. Because North Korea is continuously making an argument that we want to launch satellites for our own social good. And a couple of years back, in fact, they have invited a few scientists and few uh, media persons also to uh, watch the launch. So is there a possibility that countries like China or for that matter South Korea offer them a facility saying that we will launch your satellite if you want to launch a satellite while you are investing into a launching system? Just a, uh, a point which I thought I could have made in the last session. Well, what I'm going to speak is about space debris. Right now there was a mention which was being made about space debris. Uh, space debris, I'm sure uh, most of you must have seen the movie called Gravity and must be generally aware of how space debris creates so much amount of a mayhem and a damage if actually it hits a satellite. Uh, it was a Hollywood movie, definitely there was something which was shown out of the proportion. But at the same time, one must understand and appreciate that there are few satellites which have gone down because of the space debris. So space debris is an issue and this issue is increasingly increasing. Now, what is actually a space debris? Space debris is uh, happening because of two things. One is because of a natural things that, and the other is because of the man-made things. The natural things, uh, you can't have a control over there. You've got asteroids, you've got comets, uh, you've got various other activities uh, which are happening out into the space, which is creating a lot amount of a smaller particles and creating certain amount of a debris. But the space debris, which is becoming detrimental to the existing space programs of various nation states, is essentially happening because of the man-made activities. And these man-made activities are not the activities which are essentially directly related with so-called anti-satellite tests and so on and so forth. Actually, every satellite launch keeps a debris out into the space. When a satellite goes dead, it becomes a space debris. So space debris are going to increase. And what happens is that if a debris hits to a other debris, there is a, a concept called Kepler syndrome. When a debris hits other debris, it creates more amount of a debris. And there is no control on these number of debris. Just a small statistics, there are around uh, 1 to 8,000 million space debris out into the space, which are less than one centimeter. Uh, but the debris which actually impact to the life of a satellite or to the health of other satellites are the debris which are in the range of 1 to 10 centimeters or debris which are more than 10 centimeters. Around 1 to 10 centimeters, there are around 900,000 debris and particularly the problematic debris are in the range of 10 centimeters or more, that is the diameter of a debris and they are hardly around 34,000 debris. But number of these debris are increasing rapidly. If you see uh, the debris which were there it, by 2010 and the debris which are there in last 10 years, last 10 years number of debris have almost increased by 50%. This has happened essentially because the human activities in the outer space is increasing very rapidly. Why are human activities increasing? Because there are more number of countries which are very keen to launch their own satellites. As it was mentioned that there are private parties who are launching their own satellites. Now we are reaching to a stage where we are talking of a space tourism as a realistic thing. It was supposed to be a certain amount of a Hollywood idea a couple of years back. But space tourism is going to become a reality. So the type of activities which are going to increase into the outer space is bound to create debris. Now at present, what is creating debris? The last stages of the rocket, which continue to remain out over there. Then there are bolts, there are other smaller parts of the rocket system. When you launch a satellite, they continue to remain over there. So these debris are continually remain over there. Now which are the areas which are more problematic as far as debris are concerned? If you look at the three orbits, that is a low, lower orbit, the medium orbit and a geostationary orbit, the number of debris which are more than 80% are into a lower orbit. And the challenge is going to multiply because of these types of constellations which are being now planned, where you will have more number of smaller satellites launch into a lower orbit. So the basic challenge right now nation states are facing because of debris are in the lower orbit. Subsequently, there are certain amount of debris which are into a higher orbit also. 
Are there any solutions as far as these debris mechanisms are concerned? Yes, as far as low earth orbit debris are concerned, uh, the low earth orbit is usually around 400 kilometers and above. If you get the debris slightly at a lower altitude, then as they enter into the Earth's atmosphere, they burn off. So if you have got a policy of ensuring that a satellite when it is launched and when the satellite goes dead, then the satellite should have a some amount of a system available where it can be brought down and allow it to enter into the Earth's atmosphere, the debris will vanish. As far as the debris which are into a geostationary orbit, that is around 36,000 kilometers above the Earth's surface, those debris can be put into a higher orbit. They call that as a graveyard orbit. So when the satellite becomes dysfunctional in a geostationary orbit, it can be pushed up because there is no other activity which is happening over there. So you can safely keep them rotating over there uh, around the Earth's surface. Uh, the problem which comes up into a medium orbit because nothing much can be done about it. Now, has people thought of how to handle these debris issues? Yes, there are a lot of things. Uh, there is a Japanese, uh, sorry, there is a German concern since 2001 onwards. They are offering a facility called end-to-end -end services where they are teaching the people who are launching their satellites that how you should ensure that at least your satellite is not creating debris. So there are a lot amount of a positive activities which are happening. But at the same time, what is happening is that you have got certain amount of ideas which have been floated, which are looking good on the face of it. But from a space security point of view, those ideas could be problematic. People are talking of space lassos, people are talking of uh, cleaning the lower uh, orbit by using lasers and various other techniques, so on and so forth. But the challenge is that today, if I am cleaning a lower orbit just to kill a debris, I may end up killing somebody else's satellite, either accidentally or intentionally. So the challenge is over there. And that's why as far as armed forces, as, as far as arms control and disarmament issues are concerned, debris becomes a very important issue. But when you look into all the UN governing body mechanisms and all that, there is no reference to a word called debris. Actually, it's good also. There is a word called object which has been continuously mentioned into various legal regimes and other activities which are happening. So one has to try to look at these issues from that perspective. Today, are we doing anything enough? There is an agency called uh, under United States Air Force, which is actually monitoring debris. But this agency is not in a position to monitor all the debris. So there is a concept called a space situational awareness where you can have certain amount of a global collaboration where people can join hands together and at least monitoring of a debris becomes a very foolproof method. Right now, everybody is depending on the US per se. There are certain other agencies also which are monitoring debris, but the type of a debris which are out into there, other smaller agencies are not able to monitor. What are the other ideas which has been flowed? Right now, the ideas which have been put onto the table, particularly there is a US project which is talking that instead of allowing a satellite to die, what happens is there are two activities which happen as far as the death of a satellite is concerned. Either its power source gets over or its antenna becomes problematic. So what they are saying is that if a satellite is dying, let's catch hold of that antenna, launch a new satellite and put the same antenna to that satellite. Because you will, uh, you will, uh, there is a good amount of a logic into doing these things. But all these things are to be done by using robotic equipments, robotic systems, so on and so forth. So there are various other issues which are associated with these entire activities. Uh, are there any methods which are there? Yes, there are debris mitigation guidelines which are there. Uh, they were working very beautifully for a couple of years. UN Corpus is also looking at this issue and all those things are working very beautifully. But the challenge which happens is that today if I have to launch 1 kg out into the space, it costs me $10,000. So when a country decides that I should have a certain amount of a system with associated with my satellite, uh, that eventually when the life of a satellite gets over, it will not remain as a debris and I will get it down. So you will require to put certain amount of a mechanism. So if weight of my satellite is supposed to be 10 kgs, then I will require a mechanism which is around 5 more kgs uh, to ensure that the things will get down. So under those circumstances, there is a good amount of a skepticism because of the cost in, included into it. Uh, SpaceX is saying that we will allow uh, instead of 10,000 kgs by 2,000 kgs, that sort of a range which they are projecting. So there are good companies which are working on these things. But at the same time, there is a lot amount of issue because of the creation of debris. And I think over a period of time, this problem is going to be more challenging. Today, we were talking in the morning about normative laws. 
Uh, as far as debris mitigation guidelines are concerned, it is more of a that sort of a thing and it is working very perfectly. But I think a time is going to come where you will have to have certain amount of a legally binding mechanisms which will allow you to ensure that no man-made debris at least remains out into the space. This is where I'll stop. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I, I didn't think it was possible to make debris management interesting, but you, you somehow uh, <laughs> were able to do that and, and in a rather convincing way uh, describe some of the problems. But, uh, and and I, I, I think the, the notion that you are responsible for deorbiting your satellite if it's in low Earth orbit makes a lot of sense, but it would also require the deorbiting of the upper stages that delivered the satellite and as you mentioned, um, the separation of the final stage in the satellite creates uh, debris itself. So uh, just deorbiting the satellite and possibly the upper stages, is, it does not provide a perfect and complete solution. Um, but it, it is a, a, a move in the right direction. Uh, next, I would like to hand it over to Alexandra. Thank, thank you. you. Um, thank you very much, everyone. Um, I'm going to take a slightly different um, perspective. Um, Conversations about arms control when we think about space usually get mixed up with discussions concerning the militarization and weaponization of space, which I think is really, really unhelpful. Space is militarized. It has been since the late 50s. It is an essential environment for military operations. You can't separate it out. So any concerns when people think we have to, you know, worried about the, the militarization of space, just forget it. it, it's too late. It's also weaponized. Again, people think we need to stop the weaponization of space. And there's an important distinction to be made between weaponized space and weapons in space. Space is weaponized because it's part of the kill chain. People talk about the first Gulf War being the first space war because it's the first time GPS played a really, really important role in military operations. 80%, I think it's around 80% of US munitions in Afghanistan were precision guided, GPS, space. <coughs> so space is a weaponized environment. But we have to think then about, okay, if we can accept that, if we can just move on from that, what do we actually mean when we think about weapons in space? And Michael alluded to this, it's really, really hard to define a space weapon. Are you talking about the destruction of a satellite or the disruption or denial of a satellite, which would have an impact on you know, something that's going on on the ground, but is maybe not permanent? And is that going to become more likely? You know, Kinetic ASATs, we've heard they create debris. They're very obvious. It's easy to attribute them. Non-kinetic um, lasers that can dazzle optical sensors, jamming, spoofing, that we see going on all the time. They're difficult to attribute, they're not permanent. But they also might be more useful. We've heard about mega constellations. If you've got thousands of satellites that are all linked, you use an anti-satellite missile, you take one out, probably not gonna make too much of a difference. It, it, it's really not, apart from creating a huge amount of debris. There's a, there's a cost balance there that, that's actually gonna move towards benefiting the operators of a mega constellation rather than the operators and the, and the creators of an anti-satellite missile. So if we have trouble thinking about what we mean by a weapon, maybe we should use a different term. And one term that we use is counter space capabilities. This is any capability that is preventing someone else from using and accessing their space assets and more importantly, the information from their space assets. As I mentioned, you know, jamming GPS signals, which goes on all the time. But this includes, it's not just about the space asset itself, it's also about interfering with the up and down links and the ground control stations. You don't have to hit the satellite, you can actually attack the ground control station, which could have a similar impact. And so you have to start thinking about space, not on its own, not as... Um, it's just happening there. You've got to put it into these broader concepts, uh, military concepts of multi-domain operations. It is, I've heard it described quite well, the connective tissue that, that comes through its communications, its intelligence, uh, it, it's, all, it's all the GPS signals, the navigation. You can't just separate space out and then, and then carry on operating as you were. A response in space, and you know, if you have an attack in space, 
the response might not be in space. You might not have the capability to respond back. They might not have a satellite with similar capabilities that would be a proportional response. So you might be looking at a cyber attack or a diplomatic attack. And we're seeing a proliferation then of counter space capabilities beyond the, the main actors who have you know, the, the bigger kinetic uh, ASATs. So I think we, ha you know, we have to think a bit about why are we talking about arms control in space? Is it just about kinetic ASATs and debris and ensuring the sustainability of orbit? Or is it within a military context? Is it about actually protecting military assets and ensuring the continued support of space to military operations? And they're not mutually, ex mutually exclusive, but there are some differing priorities. So we need to understand both um, communities need to understand the, the priorities of the others and, and, and what they're trying to achieve. And, and how are we defining an arms race in space? You know, we, we have these treaties that people are trying to get through, preventing an arms race. What does that actually mean? Who, who are the actors involved? How do we know if someone's won the race? Is it, does it just, just keep going? Um, and I think that it's one of the reasons, amongst many others, um, many of which are very political, that getting an overarching treaty like Paros, the Preventing an Arms Race and Outer Space Treaty, is, is actually going to be really, really difficult. So I think we need to be looking at supplementing the Outer Space Treaty with more specific agreements um, on certain capabilities. So, for example, if we look at rendezvous and proximity operations, the ability to maneuver and approach other satellites, is there perhaps an agreed minimum distance that you can approach another satellite? And if you cross that, that, that boundary, that other satellite can say, no, you are too close now. And, and, and that is an agreed distance, and I now have the right to respond. And, and, and just adding some clarity. And then smaller agreements that, that could lead to larger ones. Um, and we heard earlier talking about you know, trust and confidence building measures and guidelines on responsible behavior, rules of the road. And these are all, they're really important. They cover all space actors and they very importantly bring in that commercial sector, which already we're seeing some of their capabilities you know, surpassing those of nation states. And at the moment, it's a little bit like the Wild West up there. there, there there's, there's, there's not a lot that's stopping people just doing what they want. The problem is, you know, a lot of these, the, these guidelines, et cetera, they're not binding. And all it takes is, is one actor just not to sign up, one actor to just say, you know, yeah, I've signed up, but there's, there's nothing anyone can really do if I, if I just decide to, uh, to go a bit, a bit further. And I think there's another narrative there that uh, I, I don't think is, is often very helpful. And I heard it, I think it was last year, Vice President Mike Pence, mentioned that you know, space had been a sanctuary. Um, and now it wasn't. Now it had become this, it, it's never been a sanctuary but until you know, we started putting stuff up there. And another one on the peaceful uses of space, because space capabilities, space technology is inherently dual use. Um, you can have commercial launchers, which you know, might launch peaceful satellites, but they're also launching national security payloads. You've got commercial satellites that are being used by militaries. GPS, you might argue, is peaceful, but it was developed by the US Air Force. It's military run. So I think also, you know, in a time of conflict, when you know, space is playing a really important role on what we're seeing happening on the ground, how much thoughts about sustainability of orbit are actually going to be coming in? Is that, is that really going to start stopping, you know, military leaders from taking action if they feel that that's really important. Um, it's not to say that conflict in space, I don't think it has to be inevitable, um, and, and certainly goes against a lot of the rhetoric you're seeing, particularly in the United States at the moment, about space as a war fighting domain. Again, something I'm not very keen on calling it. Um, but we, need, we, we just need to be aware that for all the talk about sustainability, for all the talk about, we, you know, we, we want to preserve this for the benefits, um, as long as it is playing such a central role in military operations, um, anything that we can come up with um, could just uh, be, be, be wiped out um, if, if, if conflict in, in, in how you want to define it actually kind of, you know, goes orbital. And I'll stop there. 
Thank you. The, um, you, you very um, concretely kind of laid out some of the, the um, issues that relate, you know, more to the military aspects or the um, specific weapons that might be pl uh, placed in space and some of the capabilities that uh, I think you termed them counter space um, capabilities uh, and what they could do and, and some measures that, that might be um, examined or pursued to, to minimize um, the, I guess, the outbreak of increasingly competitive um, um, attempts to protect and de protect one's own satellites and degrade those of others. Um, next, I'd, I'd like to hand the floor over to Minister Ma. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chair. It is really a great <coughs> pleasure for me to share with you some of uh, my perspectives on the uh, arms control in outer space. First of all, I would uh, touch upon the current situation in outer space security. As we know, as we know, with the rapid development of space technology and its application, the outer space is faced with ever increasing risks and challenges while providing new development opportunities for humankind. The first point is that the trend of space being weaponized and turned into a battlefield is becoming more and more prominent, and the risk of an arms race in outer space is growing. In this regard, we are witnessing, on the part of the United States, a strategy of dominance of outer space is being pursued. The outer space is defined as a war fighting domain. A Space Force Command has been established, and the U.S. Space Force is being organized. The deployment of anti-missile interceptors is also being planned. Some other space powers are also formulating and introducing space military strategies and strengthening their military capabilities in outer space. Most recently, as we say, the, the NATO declared that the outer space as a new operation, operational domain after land, sea, and air. We do not know exactly what operational domain means here. If my colleagues from the NATO members could make some clarification, it would be very useful. This, I think, personally, the most severe and outstanding challenge in outer space, both at the present stage and in the future. This is the first point I want to touch. The second point I want to see that the current legal system related to outer space no longer meets the security, security challenges in outer space because of its loopholes and the development of space technologies. As I mentioned, with the deepening military use of outer space, in particular the development of space weapon technologies, limitations of the current legal system are increasingly apparent. For example, as we know, the 1967 Outer Space Treaty prohibits only the deployment of nuclear weapons and other weapons of mass destruction, while this treaty does not prohibit the deployment of weapons of other kinds. So in such a sense, the current space legal system does not suffice to prevent the trend of space weaponization or prevent an arms race in outer space. This is the challenge in the legal aspect. The third point is that the negotiation of Space Arms Control Treaty fails to start due to the block by certain countries, either in the Conference on Disarmament or in some other multilateral fora. As we know, a certain country is not willing to accept any restrictions because of its own military strategy and has long been blocking the start of an arms race control treaty. As we know, the city has put the outer Paris subject on its agenda for, for, for 30 years, maybe more than 30 years, but because of the strong opposition from one country, the, city, uh, the, the conference on the summit so far failed to start the substantial negotiation of a, such a treaty. 
I think this is the challenge in the political aspect. The fourth challenge is that the space environment is deteriorating with the space orbit congested and the space debris increased, as mentioned by colleagues uh, moments, uh, moments ago. With more and more countries and actors are participating in space activities, the space orbit is becoming congested, space debris are increasing and will increase. The long-term sustainability, as we, as we call it, the LTS, is facing series of challenges. This challenge, I think, is the challenge in this aspect of development. So these are the four major challenges I want to share with you. These are the challenges we are facing in the field of space, space arms control. Okay. The second part of my uh, presentation, I, I would like to focus on the, uh, the, the, the efforts made by the international community so far. But uh, as experts here around this table, you must be very clear about the multilateral efforts, either in the conference on disarmament, on either or, or in the uh, UNDC, United Nations Disarmament Commission, or somewhere else. Uh, to save time, I will omit all, all my uh, point, speaking points here. Uh, I will focus on the uh, next steps. Uh, frankly speaking, the failure to start negotiations on space arms control, uh, uh, space arms control treaty, is mainly due to political uh, reasons rather than technical reasons. The fundamental re the reason is that a certain country or some countries does not want any restrictions on its development of military capabilities. I think this is the true reason uh, for, for the uh, block of negotiations. Uh, in order to maintain the, long last, the lasting peace in outer space and prevent the outer space from becoming a domain of arms race and battlefield, as declared by some countries so far, the international community should take due and full consideration the current situation in outer space, strengthen dialogue and cooperation with a view to starting negotiations of a legally binding instrument, not a normatively uh, approach, huh? legally binding instrument. For this purpose, I think I have the following ideas or suggestions. The first one is that we have to strengthen political will. As we know, without, political, uh, without uh, all the necessary political will, we could do nothing. Without any political will, any minor technical issue in the discussion of such a treaty could become a kind of fatal obstacle. All the countries, especially those space-faring countries, should keep a clear mind on the current space security trends and their serious consequences. Demonstrate all necessary political will to support the negotiation of arms, arms control treaty and take part in the negotiations in a responsible and constructive manner. This is the first point. The second point I want to stress is that we should stick to multilateralism. We all should support the UN, the Conference on Disarmament in particular, to play its role as the major channel. Before this Conference on Disarmament forms its work plan and start the negotiations, a technical group could be considered further considered to further discuss those technical issues such as the scope, verification, definition, etc., on the basis of the work of the UNGGE established last year. We could also consider the establishment of an open-ended expert group to discuss all related issues of a future treaty to prepare for future negotiations. This is the uh, third point. The, uh, the second point. The third point is that we should enhance mutual confidence. All countries should strengthen dialogue and take appropriate and feasible transparency and confidence-building measures to enhance mutual trust and create favorable conditions and atmosphere for 
future negotiations. We should not accuse each other. We should not power dirty waters on the activities of other countries. The fourth point is that we should strengthen international cooperation. As a basic principle, all, all countries should not be impeded to take part in international cooperation for peaceful purposes. Otherwise, it would be difficult to rally support for such a treaty. We have lots of lessons to learn in this regard, either in chemicals or in some other areas. So this is the general idea, the general suggestions for future steps. Uh, if I, I may, I could, I would take uh, to share with you some of the uh, ideas or make some clarifications on the uh, so-called PPWT proposed by Russia and China. I would uh, make some remarks, share with you on this uh, draft treaty. Uh, as colleagues here may be aware that some years ago, China and Russia put forward a draft treaty on outer space control. Fundamentally speaking, the PPWT is a direct response to the pressing situation in outer space and to, to the strong call of the UN resolutions on Paris. The basic purpose of this draft treaty is to fill the loopholes of the current legal system and prevent the weaponization of outer space and an arms race in outer space. With these efforts, we should avoid the old path of armament first and a disarmament second. Nothing more, nothing less. No hid hidden agenda in this respect at all. As you can see, there are two core obligations in the draft PPWT. Number one, no placement of weapons in outer space. Number two, no threat or use of force against outer space objects. These are the two most fundamental obligations envisioned in this treaty. The, the, with these two key obligations, we try to focus on the major activities or behavior that threaten the security of our space, rather than focus on specific category of weapons so that we could avoid over technical debates or endless debates on technical issues. At the same time, the PPWT takes a result-based approach without differentiating specific actions ranging from space to earth, space to space, and earth to space. The purpose of this is to avoid a situation where we single out one action or one behavior, behavior, but leave out a thousand others, maybe. As you know, the, the PPWT so far is the only draft of the treaty. And the treaty, we are so glad to see that, enjoys very wide support. And many countries support the start of negotiations on, the, on this basis. Of course, needless to say, the PPWT is not perfect. We welcome any new constructive proposals to make it better so that the basis for early start of negotiations at the CD could be more solid. So these are my, uh, my uh, exp explanations to the draft treaty. I hope th those, uh, those uh, explanations could be useful for colleagues here to consider this draft treaty. I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Minister Ma. That was, um, <clears throat> uh, you laid out uh, not only a number of problems, but uh, you have proposed solutions to those problems, which is always very helpful. Um, next, um, our final speaker, um, um, Javier Pasco. I hand the floor over to you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, it's always a challenge to be the last speaker especially after all these very, very good uh, presentations. And the topics of today was the arm, arms control in outer space. And of course, this is, uh, and Peter has recorded this, uh, a necessary and desirable objective. And uh, uh, 
of course, and we have just uh, listened to um, a different approach, there are a lot of different opinions uh, behind this concept. Um, maybe. And uh, we mentioned in the previous, in the previous, I hope it doesn't, the last one is okay. Uh, we mentioned the position that there should be a legally binding uh, text, of course. And uh, some, some other countries, and you mentioned some, um, are more inclined to uh, uh, adopt a, a, a position in favor of a political regime, code of conduct. Uh, okay. And we've been uh, uh, in Europe uh, very uh, active uh, over the last years in defending uh, uh, this uh, international code of conduct for space activities. And uh, uh, with, the, with the, the idea that this might be more easily acceptable by a large number of countries with different interests uh, without being uh, uh, too much um, uh, focusing on the legally uh, binding uh, dimension that could come afterwards. Um, this was, there was also this notion. There's also a, a difference in, uh, between people who can believe that uh, it should be a first step and, and then we could go towards another one. And some of the uh, that that believe that any treaty could be uh, in the in the current space landscape, I would say, uh, would be anyway would have a limited effect uh, as the notion of space weapons. And uh, Alexander mentioned this uh, is is not um, agreed upon by any country. It remains uh, uh, difficult to precisely define what a space weapon is. Uh, using it intentionally for destroying a satellite, you could use a civilian satellite. Or, or, or something that is not intended at first to, to be a military um, uh, weapon. So the case for preventing an arms race in outer space um, uh, would really uh, 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 first rely on, on a general agreement on preliminary definitions. But beyond this, and I will go very quickly because uh, uh, and a lot of things have been said, uh, beyond this, um, we, we clearly recognize that, and this is a new thing, that the military today uh, have, uh, have a clear perception that space is playing a more and more important role in their own operations down to Earth. And this has created a different context uh, than the one has been uh, dominant over the, uh, uh, I would say, four first decades of the space history. Um, space at this time was devoted to strategic uh, monitoring and, and was not so much military per se. It has become much more like this uh, for uh, something like two decades with the post-Cold War conflicts and all this. And all the major powers are using space intensively in their military operations. Which means that, uh, uh, of course, uh, military tend to invest in space. They rely on the space assets. Uh, so that believes it can be a threat, it can be a, a, a target, it can be threatened by, by a system that would like to affect defensive uh, capability as a whole by uh, targeting the space systems. And this has created a, a, a different political, uh, I would say, uh, alchemy in a sense, as far as space is concerned. And there's another thing at the same time, uh, uh, the space landscape, again, I like this expression, is, is is about to be deeply transformed. We mentioned the mega constellations coming from the private sector. Uh, we're talking in, in our seminar, the, uh, Peter mentioned the seminar we had last Monday, some, some uh, uh, private firm, a very well-known private firm, looking at things uh, and at systems, you know, made the calculations that uh, if all the projects are, are realized in less than 10 years, we'll have 57, 850 satellites in the sky. Of course, all these allies won't exist, all this project won't survive. But even if only a fraction survive, uh, it's going to be much more different than we have experienced in, in, the, in the history in space. So, you know, it's a fact for every one of us. The space environment is being changed. And so we will have to coexist in a clearly, in a, in a really new, uh, uh, I would say, physical context. And by the way, physics in space is also a constraining factor. We all depend on physics. So we all have to discuss these things. I quite agree with you when you mention the fact that there should be channels uh, for communication between, even at the technical level, I think this is very important. It's important to create the dialogue. Uh, we're all interdependent in space. And uh, we mentioned the kinetic problem. You know, as, as, as soon as some country is creating a kinetic 
problem uh, by, by destroying satellites, is shooting a, a, a bullet in his own foot, in fact, you, you know, because it, it will also uh, 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 be affected. So this is something we have to, uh, this environment, we have to, to take care of it uh, on a collective basis. And also, uh, beyond this uh, high number of satellites, there will be more and more, um, uh, more and cheaper and cheaper and better and better small high-performance satellites that will do many, many different things. They will move much more than before. Um, this is important, this. Um, we mentioned the um, run, um, proximity operation, or rendezvous and, and servicing, refueling, etc. All these satellites will move. We need to identify that. We, will, we need to know uh, and, and to identify those satellites. Uh, any country, any space faring country now is investing a lot in uh, systems that can monitor space activity. But this space activity is getting more and more complex because of the number of the satellites and because of what they do. And it's not uh, uh, trivial uh, to uh, really understand what is the object you're looking at. So this will be also uh, another uh, uh, key um, element to take into account when we discuss about uh, um, um, collective security in space. Uh, so space, the space, there will be more and more space events. If we go towards these mega constellations, that's going to be a lot of space events. And these space events were going to be more and more difficult to anticipate and more, even more difficult to model. Uh, this is something we have to realize. And if we talk about arms control, if we talk about uh, space security, we have to take this into account because the context itself will be much more sensitive in terms of what we know, what we understand. And the mutual trust, again, I, I agree with you, is, is, is key on this. Uh, and by the way, this uncertainty, space is going to be more and more uncertain as an environment. And this is what has prompted military uh, communities to consolidate their posture in space at a time when, when uh, there's a lot of uh, their operations are relying more and more on space. Uh, they need to be more and more self-confident when they're doing space things. And so we are witnessing a moment where military uh, consider space, that space is not yes, a sanctuary anymore. It's never been so much, but it's even less so, uh, uh, in their view at least. And uh, uh, all that has been served by, of course, uh, um, improving technologies. Really, the technology has, has, has progressed a lot for the last uh, 15 years, uh, allowing things that should have been even envisioned uh, some 20 years ago. Uh, and then uh, uh, you see terms like space deterrence emerging. You want to deter your opponent or supposedly adversary uh, uh, from, from attacking you. Uh, well, this, this concept can be discussed. At least what you want to be, yes, and you mentioned that, Michael, you want to be more resilient. That's for sure. A, a satellite, again, is very vulnerable and very easy to attack. And you want to discourage. You want to discourage uh, the attack by de minimizing the benefits of the adversary. So you will rely on many, many, many different satellites. So it will be very, very difficult to affect you, really. And you, in some countries, you might want to impose cost. And then if you attack me, I will impose your cost. It can be in space, it can be uh, on, on the ground, etc. cetera. Um, so this is precisely where security in space goes beyond the sole issue of arms control, in my view. Uh, but it includes also uh, 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 a more largely, uh, more largely a situation where, where the uh, uh, new commercial system will be part of the resiliency architecture and the be part of the resiliency strategy and how they might be used. They're very much used by the military, by the way, as, as, as uh, already today, but they will be more and more used when you have all this infrastructure in space. It's been used by many, many different users. So you will... Uh, create some sort of uh, added value for this kind of, uh, from, from a strategic perspective and from an arms control perspective. We have to keep that in mind. Um, so more and more military have, have used non-military systems as a complement or as an augmentation uh, of their own systems. And it will only amplify with the advance of mega constellations, that's for sure. You mentioned planet, but we can also talk about the telecommunications, uh, uh, satellites, you know, that we are in lower orbit, you know. 20 years ago, you couldn't even uh, create a satellite uh, uh, in lower orbit that would make a space communication. Space communication was, was done with geostationary satellite, 36,000 uh, kilometers high. And now, because of the new systems, you can do that. And so, uh, um, uh, this will be a complete new dimension. This will be a complete new dimension with a lot of advantages, some drawbacks, 
But uh, uh, more and more you will see a different infrastructure systems that could be used when you choose to use them. And so, of course, uh, 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 this will have, of course, obviously this has to have, and this is what one of the output we have had from our last seminar, uh, a, a dimension that should have to be included in our debate on, on space security and arms control in outer space. That's for sure. The link is created, as there's no possibility to delink this. Uh, so that's very, very important. So it seems to me that the, the new dynamics in space will change very quickly the basics of our discussions in space security. That's, that's for sure. And in this context, and that might be a, maybe not a, a, a different, but an alternative or, or something, a parallel uh, path to follow uh, 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 in relation with what has been just previously by the previous speaker. Uh, in this context, I think that getting agree on those new rules, such as the 21 LTS guidelines, long-term sustainability guidelines that have been mentioned by Peter uh, uh, Havlik uh, in the Corpus, uh, it, it might well be a first pragmatic step in discussing, in creating mutual confidence before more definitive security discussion can take place. And I think, I, I really believe that uh, um, these strategies may not be mutually exclusive. Uh, 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 we're not talking about a zero-sum game here, but I think much more about uh, complementary approach. Uh, it will take time. We know that it has taken, I think, something like 10 years to get agree on these 21 guidelines. There's a more, uh, there are eight guidelines that remains to be agreed upon. Uh, of course, the eight more difficult. It's, good, it's a good forum to discuss these things and, and create this mutual confidence that we start there. Great, thank you. Um, we covered a, a, a wide spectrum of, of issues related to space. And I, and I tried to kind of jot some of the, the areas, and then I want to move to the question and the answers. But, you know, we have not only the military security of space. I mean, you know, there are military assets, and they, they, countries will want to protect them. But you also have uh, the sustainable sustain, sustainability of space operations. Um, and both can be threatened by, you know, just the, the debris in space and, and other things. You have... Um, you know, weapons in space versus weaponization of space. I think we, as, as Aunt, um, Alexandra said, you know, weaponization of space has um, probably started right around 1957. But, you know, the actual placement of weapons in space is different. You know, the disruption versus destruction of satellites in space. You have uh, counter space activities. They could be, you know, terrestrial, terrestrial or they could be space-based. Um, all these need to be managed, and the question is, are there legal frameworks, normative frameworks, or political commitments uh, that are necessary, or are we going to end up relying on deterrence um, to, to prevent uh, another country from attacking a satellite or disrupting a satellite? Um, these are all kind of foundational questions when it comes to space, um, and I'd like to, I hope that we are able to pursue some of those in, during the question and answer. So without further ado, if you can place your tents up, um, and, and I'll try to read your name, or someone will bring me a list of names. I think the first I see is Haider. Okay. Yes, thank you, uh, Chair. Just three very brief uh, observations or comments. One is that uh, in talking about constellations, mega constellations, we, at least some of us tend to forget that you know we began with Iridium a long time ago. Uh, which was a constellation, and it was for communications. And also, uh, <clears throat> when it went bankrupt, it was uh, revived or bought up by the U.S. Department of Defense for military uh, communications and still serving civilians. The second is Ms. Strickland's comment that with all this militarization, uh, going towards some legal framework would be very difficult because then in, in case of conflict, uh, all bets would be off. So that's that's true, but I think that's true of any uh, negotiation or any effort to lead to some arms control or uh, limitation or mitigation treaty or measure, because that could be said for everything. If, if, uh, if uh, push comes to shove, maybe uh, countries would go nuclear, or despite the NPT, maybe they develop weapons which are banned, etc. So I'm not quite sure that is uh, something which should introduce some sort of paralysis in the system. Uh, the last thing is that uh, uh, in Pakistan we like we have a commitment to peaceful uses, and uh, uh, we believe that the guidelines for mitigation uh, of uh, uh, space debris by the 
scientific and te technical committee of COPUS uh, needs to be followed. And uh, in 2010, we had offered uh, our, our, our neighbor India in CBN talks uh, uh, that we should have start bilateral discussions on, on regional, uh, on outer space, uh, non-weaponization. We were a bit disappointed that this was not uh, <coughs> reciprocated because the counter argument was that we should leave this to the international uh, forum. And, uh, and then we had the Indian uh, satellite uh, test with the resulting debris, which is also disturbing to us. And, and for our part, where we have recently signed a joint statement with Russia against the first placement of uh, weapons in outer space. So we remain committed to purely peaceful uses uh, in Pakistan of outer space. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I see one tent up down there. Um, oh. Um, Kanika, please. Hi, thank you. Uh, I had one question for uh, our EU panelists over here. I uh, was wondering, uh, you mentioned in the last uh, segment where you were talking about complementarity and uh, norm-based as uh, what the EU's approach is to uh, space issues. Uh, how would you place this entirely with uh, with the France's space uh, agency that's coming up and also the they haven't come out with the proper doctrine but they do they have come out with a set of guidelines as to what is uh, what uh, is driving what is the driving force behind them so how does that fit with the EU model of complementarity and norms and uh, the other question was for uh, Mr. Ma Sheng Hun sorry uh, it was on uh, uh, the Russia-Pakistan statement that uh, Ambassador Re just mentioned. Uh, I was just wondering what the Chinese perspective is on the uh, statement that uh, has come out, if you could give any comments. So, thank you. Thank you. Everyone is being shy or everyone wants to have a lengthy coffee break? Okay, thank you. Um, Elena, please. Oops. Uh, <clears throat> I uh, heard uh, suggestions uh, about um, looking also at the area of uh, kind of comparing the uh, space uh, traffic and uh, management of debris and everything else to comparing it to the uh, traffic that we regulate uh, on um, Earth and uh, comparing it to the regulations at sea. So whether there is a room for negotiating something like a rules for the traffic management of space. I think that it is a very um, promising area where you can have a very strong um, representation and the voice from the industry, because that's what they're interested mostly. Uh, and I wanted to hear, first of all, um, whether this idea is uh, already something that is being discussed and what are the prospects of uh, getting to something like a traffic management in the space, which is not about military, but it's a very important part. Uh, thank you. When I, when I was informed I was going to uh, chair the, this particular panel, one of the first things I did was look at the um, laws of the sea, which is something, and I didn't realize that the laws of the sea went back more than a thousand years in the first uh, general law was was established in 1608, I think it was, um, and it's gone through many revisions. And I suspect that the same thing is going to happen with uh, the space domain as well. Um, but next, I have Ar Ar um, Artem. Yeah. Hello, I'm Artem Lazar from BCDNP. My question with regard to the. Uh, reaching the political will internationally in terms of safety and security of outer space. So we know from the history that sometimes mankind needs a dramatic event to go forward and to unite. For example, uh, after the Chernobyl catastrophe, there was a strong push for nuclear safety uh, conventions. After the revelation of Ira Iraq's clandestine nuclear program, additional protocol to safeguards was adopted. And then after 9-11, there was a strong push to, towards nuclear security measures. So what do you think would be a dramatic event, well, uh, fortunately, 
but uh, that will push uh, the mankind to the adoption, final adoption of safety and security documents uh, concerning outer space. Thanks. Well, let's hope it doesn't come to a catalytic event <laughs> that, that drives us, but um, history has shown such events um, can often motivate uh, discussion and, and really push negotiations forward. Uh, the last name I have is Anne. Thank you very much. I'm Anne Kempain, head of the disarmament section at the EU delegation uh, in Geneva. I'm sure my colleague uh, Peter Havlik, uh, whose intervention I unfortunately missed, probably already explained to you the reasons why the EU thinks that the TCBMs, the transparency and confidence building measures, are the most realistic way for the moment, at least, uh, uh, to, to enhance uh, security in outer space. Uh, at the same time, the EU has always said that, as such, we don't exclude the possibility of legally binding uh, instruments. Uh, but there are three criteria, at least, uh, to make such legally binding instrument feasible. They have to be comprehensive, they have to be verifiable, and there has to be a definition. And on all these uh, issues, unfortunately, the Russian-Chinese uh, uh, draft uh, proposal, PPWT, does not meet the expectations, because if you first look at the first issue, the comprehensiveness, uh, the ground-based uh, anti-satellite uh, weapons are not included um, uh, in, in that scope of the treaty, and we understand uh, Russia and China are both uh, developing such capabilities. Then on the verification, UNIDIR, for example, has uh, made many studies and publications pointing to the technical problems uh, in the verification of a possible ban of a space uh, weapon. And, and then finally also uh, uh, on the definition, I mean, there's no international definition uh, what would uh, constitute a space, uh, def de uh, space weapon, and also these are multi-purpose uh, uh, devices uh, with the civilian uh, uses, so how do, you, how do you define what object in outer space uh, would and could be used uh, as a weapon? So, so there are, there are many, many problems. It's not so easy to, to come up with, uh, with the legal instrument, I think, in this area. Thank you. Thank you. Well, we have about 10 minutes left, and I want to hand the floor back to um, each of the panelists and give them about two minutes. Um, Professor, um, uh, um, Minister Ma, I think we'll give you a little, <laughs> give you a little more time because um, I think some of the questions were asked of you directly, but I wanted to start in the same order that we spoke. So, AJ? Thank you. There are no specific questions to me, but just a few random thoughts. Uh, when we are talking of a space today, there has been a talk that is space a common heritage to mankind. From that today, we are talking of NATO establishing a, face, a space as a fifth dimension of a warfare. So much has happened over a period of time, and one has to look at it from that perspective. So from a legal perspective, is the existing space law mechanism uh, accurate? for handling modern problems or we require a space law 2.0. One has to really look at it. Uh, as far as uh, the European Space Code of Conduct was concerned, it was a very interesting uh, experiment, one can say. It went out till uh, four iterations, but still nothing has emerged out. Uh, simultaneously, the Hague Code of Conduct has done a good job. So somewhere that normative behavior was not taking place as far as space is concerned. I think the basic challenge in the space domain right now is the elephant in the room is a missile defense. Today, if I say that weaponization of a space should be banned, my entire missile defense architecture comes to a standstill. Uh, because that is what is going to be a major problem and that's where the major countries will have certain amount of opposition. And that's why I think particularly the US is not interested into uh, looking at those issues. Uh, at the same time, space diplomacy is working very fine. Countries like US and Russia are pretty good friends as far as space is concerned. International Space Station is one example. Other example is the spy satellites of uh, US which have been launched by using a Russian engine RL 180 or something. And that's happening for quite some time. So people understand that fighting in a space is of no use because there is too much of a stake as far as space is concerned. So one has to look at from that perspective. Uh, an interesting comment about space traffic management, that idea is in there for quite some time. There has been arguments that should we have something like in aviation, we've got ICAO. Should there be an ICAO as far as space is concerned? So people are talking about it. But as you say correctly, that these issues are going to come up in near future because more amount of activities are going to happen in space. And you require a certain amount of a guidance mechanism as far as space is concerned. 
then as far as small satellites are concerned because today people are thinking of managing internet with small satellites you don't want the uh, ocean cables to manage the internet so internet 2.0 has to be based on small satellites so that activity is going to continue uh, there was a point which was raised about india's asat test i think i'll make uh, three small points over here as far as india's asat test was concerned it was not against specifically any country Number two is that India has got issues as far as nuclear NPT mechanism is concerned because you have got a treaty where five countries have joined hands together and said the rest of the world is a second class citizen in a sense. They can't hold nuclear weapons. India never wanted that thing to come up into a space domain also. So tomorrow there was a possibility that US, China and Russia could join hands together and say that only we can do a ASAT. So that sort of ambiguity which was existing into a nuclear domain, India wanted that ambiguity not to exist. That was the reason. And as far as India's test was concerned, almost 99% of the debris has got down. So India did a very calculated test at a very low altitude, ensuring that the debris will get down. Thank you. Thank you. Alexandra? Um, okay, just a few responses. Um, we mentioned, I mean, constellations, yes, they have been around for a while, like Iridium, but we're talking mega constellations. We're talking two to 5,000 satellites um, in, in one orbital plane. The problem is that you can expect a 5 to probably more like a 10% failure rate. So if you're putting up 5,000 satellites, that's a lot of junk that you're just launching um, that you can't do anything about. Um, one of the other problems is with the new actors, it's the communication amongst them. Uh, there was a recent event not that long ago where uh, there was a conjunction warning between the European Space Agency satellite and a Starlink satellite, and the uh, ESA could not communicate, could not reach SpaceX. Um, you've got operators having to Google um, contact details of other companies when there's a conjunction warning. So, that, so the, the more you've got up there, the more conjunction warnings you have um, just gets really complicated. You mentioned as well, in the case of conflict, all bets are off, no different from other areas. That's exactly the point. Too much, we're having these conversations and we're thinking about space as being something completely different. We need to treat it differently. Whereas in a lot of, and yes, that's very true in a lot of ways. But when we're starting to think about, you know, the 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 role of militaries and, and how militaries are, are, are going to be talking about things and how conflict can change stuff, we need to actually not look at it too differently. Um, looking at sort of a balance between the EU wanting to... Um, you know, sort of lead on complementarity and, and these norms and then individual states um, with, with, with their own, uh, you know, we've seen it with France recently with, uh, you know, plans for the like, space agency. The UK is doing a lot of work. Of course, the UK, uh, uh, the US with, um, you know, space command. I think that that's just, we're always going to see that individual countries will have their own um, requirements and, and, and their own priorities, but you know when you're part of uh, a multilateral body like the EU that has a history of, of, of that kind of work, I just think that's that that's I, I don't know, you can't necessarily explain it, but I think we just have to have to live with that. Um, on space traffic management, um, one of the difficulties is that traditionally space situational awareness and the tracking of space objects has been behind a military firewall. That is changing now. We're seeing a lot of um, commercial companies providing that information and we're seeing the responsibility, at least in the US, for that coming out of the Department of Defense and moving probably into the Department of Commerce. Um, there are a lot of people working on this. There are a lot of people talking about the need for an international body of some kind that is, that is helping to manage this. The difficulty is always who's going to do it, who's going to pay for it, um, who will run it, does it sit within the UN? Does it sit somewhere else? Um, how do we deal with that data? And a lot of the problems still that um, we, we, we can't, we don't know where anything is. I mean, we, we're pretty good. You, you can tell mostly where a functioning satellite is, but it, there's, there's still an error. So you start bringing debris into it. It's, it's very difficult. Some crossovers with maritime, but, but also some, some differences, particularly when you take physics into it. And I think I just want to pick up on something AJ said. There is a balance. Like, no one wants to lose access to space. Uh, there are too many benefits. There's too much to lose. And I think, you know, if you look at just, just within the great powers, there, there is a balance there, and it kind of works. The problem is when you get a new actor, a non-state actor, who just throws a curveball in, to, to bring a baseball metaphor in. And that, that's where we have to be worried. 
Um, I'm actually, I know I, I probably sounded really negative earlier, but I'm actually quite positive about the future of space. I really like the idea that a Brit raised the baseball analogy. Yeah. Um, and I, I wonder if, if the U.S. is moving responsibility for tracking data to the Department of Commerce. Does that mean they're going to start charging for that information? There is probably an economic benefit to having all yes. of that, yes. That's unfortunate. But um, anyway. Thank you. Uh, I thank the questions uh, posed to me. I will start from, from the latest one. Otherwise, I will forget them. Uh, in discussing arms, uh, uh, arms control in outer space, we have to be clear about uh, a different, uh, difference between the peaceful use and the subject we are supposed to dis discuss this afternoon. We are discussing arms control in outer space. We are not discussing the peaceful use of outer space. That is something dealt with by the corpus in Vienna. So my understanding, at least for me, is that we are supposed to discuss arms control here uh, in outer space, rather than the peaceful use of outer space. That's why I uh, refrain from talking too much about the uh, orbital congestion, the, uh, the increase of space debris, the traffic uh, uh, management, things like that. I think those issues are very important, very critical for for the sustainable development of our space. But those issues are under the purview of copious in, uh, in Vienna, rather than the subject of our discussion here this afternoon. So we have to be clear about arms, the basic concept of arms control. That is why my presentation focuses a bit on weapons, uh, use of force in outer space, or from space to Earth, or from Earth to space, all those concepts. So we have to be clear about that. The, the, the kinetic uh, weapons, not in, uh, kinetic weapons, radio jamming, all those intentional hostile activities follows within the sphere of our discussion today. So we have to be clear about the basic concept or the basic subject we are touching upon. The first point I want to make this is, the, the second point, uh, the, yes, it's uh, right, there are quite some shortcomings uh, in the uh, PPWT proposed by Russia and China, although the draft has been revised uh, on several occasions uh, after seeking the ideas from the uh, wider uh, international community. Although uh, we made that effort, but so far we are clear that it's not perfect. To be frank, nothing will be. Nothing is perfect, and nothing will be perfect. So. In terms of the criteria set forth by the United States, of definitely this treaty does not conform to the criteria by the United States in terms of comprehensiveness, in terms of verifiability, in terms of definab uh, definability or definition. So that's why we omitted in the treaty intentionally the verification clause, because in terms of the current current technical capabilities, it could be difficult to verify whether a state party complies with the obligations envisioned in this treaty. But we think that by omitting our verification, we do not think that this will affect the effectiveness of this treaty. Because a treaty usually is designed for those compliers to, to follow the, the, the object and purpose of this treaty. If a treaty is designed to, to, to prevent uh, potential uh, violators, it would be very, very difficult. For example, every country, we have a whole system of law regarding public security, but every country cannot rule out the crimes of different kinds. So on the PPWT, we, we, we do not contain uh, the verification clause just because the lack of sophisticated or ripe verif uh, verification technologies. But I want to say that this will not affect the authority or effectiveness of this treaty if 
each and every state party to this treaty complies with it. As we know, the Outer Space Treaty of 1967 do not contain any verification clause in that treaty. But so far, I'm so glad to see that no country violates law by pl placing nuclear weapons in outer space so far. I hope that is true. Uh, on the uh, comprehensiveness, yes, you mentioned that uh, anti-satellite weapons, from, especially from Earth, is not included. But as I explained in my presentation, we do not try to list each and every specific actions or each and every specific weapons in the treaty. We try to prohibit this kind of behavior or activities. We prohibit the use of force against outer space objects. We do not list whether it is from space. We do not see that it should be from the air. We do not specifically define that this activity should be the attack from the ground. But by this simple sentence, we cover all those scenarios. So when you are seeing that the treaty is not comprehensive enough, I do not agree. I see that this is the most comprehensive manner to describe or to de prohibit all those possible activities. I hope you could understand my point there. Sorry for my poor English in explaining this, uh, uh, this very uh, seemingly uh, reasonable counter-argument against this treaty. If the use of force is prohibited against uh, outer space object, so can you imagine that a country is, uh, is authorized to, to fire a missile against satellites in outer space? So the answer is very clear. Definition. Definition is very, very complex issue. We tried to enlist, to enlist a few definitions in the draft treaty, but we think that it's also very risky. People tend to ask, what is a weapon? What is a weapon? Nobody knows. Sometimes for diplomats, especially for those supporters of the diplomats, they tend to be very pedantic. We have to be clear about what is a weapon. Ladies and, ladies and gentlemen, what is a weapon? Can you, who can give me an authoritative answer to this definition? What is an outer space weapon? Nobody knows. <laughs> but if you look, look at quite a number of international laws and treaties, we do not and not all of them have <coughs> definitions there. But nobody tries to challenge the, the, the purpose or object of those treaties. That says a lot. So this is the, the, uh, some of the uh, explanations to this. By seeing that, I'm not seeing that the PPWT is a perfect, something perfect. Everybody has to take it or leave it. No, it's open to further discussions. We welcome any new ideas, either on the core obligations or some other articles. But by criticiz criticizing this treaty and refusing to start negotiations without any constructive proposals is something not constructive. This is uh, another point. Political will, yes, political will is very important. This treaty is designed to prevent the worst scenario from happening. As I said, we should not follow the old path in the nuclear disarmament. We have made lots of nuclear weapons, more than enough nuclear weapons, and then we spend lots of resources to disarm, <coughs> to get rid of those weapons. So we have similar cases in the nuclear arsenal fields, and we have, the chem we have these cases in the chemical weapons case. So some countries are still using lots of resources to destroy their chemical weapons. 
They still have thousands or thousands of tons of chemical weapons. So in the, in the field of outer space, we do not want that to happen again. That is the purpose, preventive diplomacy. That is the value of this draft treaty. So without, but sadly, lots of criticism were raised against this treaty. Lots of interesting questions were mentioned without any constructive and specific proposal to improve it. And if you do not totally agree with, do not agree with this treaty in a categorical manner, why not come up with something new? This is an appeal from me at this moment. If you have grand ideas, new ideas, I will wait and for wait for your proposal. That is important. So, by seeing this, the importance of outer space cannot be overestimated. We are relying on outer space technologies in our daily life. So we cannot afford a situation where war will be fighting in outer space by bogging, being bog, bogged down in those technical discussions. Any more points? Actors. Yes, in, in addition to countries, we have more and more non-state actors taking part in space activities. But whatever those actors or non-state actors they should follow the basic international law, international rules. They should be under the jurisdiction of each and every sovereign state. Nobody should escape from the, the, the global governance of outer space or in, in other fields. One minute. No. OK, I'm sorry, I forget about the, the first statement issue. I, what kind of statement? Sorry. Maybe we could discuss it later uh, after. Yeah. Sorry for, for taking so much time. No, thank you. Um, I, I think that it's incumbent upon all of us to, to accept your challenge of, of either uh, making suggestions to improve uh, what you have proposed already or to come up with something new. Um, and I always, on the definition issue, I would note that the NPT does not define a nuclear weapon. Uh, so that sometimes definitions are too difficult to reach. Um, Javier, you have the last word, and you stand between everybody else and coffee. Uh, but <laughs> I don't okay. mean that to discourage you, you from speaking. <laughs> no, no, I will be very quick. And, uh, and um, um, just uh, a few questions. You mentioned the complementarity issue. And I was, I was uh, uh, talking about the complementarity be between the um, uh, U European Union effort of the Code of Conduct and, and this uh, 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 treaty draft, draft uh, uh, treaty uh, Mr. Maas just mentioned. I think I still uh, keep thinking that uh, these two things can live together at some point and, and create, I think, uh, uh, some uh, channel for communications and increasing confidence over the years. Um, and, and allowing allowing a political mutual understanding on this. Uh, you mentioned the France defense uh, space defense strategy. Indeed, there has been a, a, a defense space strategy has been issued last July in France, and uh, and indeed uh, 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 clearly uh, 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 this is uh, uh, what I said previously. The realization by the military that space was really playing a role, an increasing role in what they do, and especially for France in the EU domain. By the way. France is one of the only country in the EU having external operations with a lot of intensive, or more or less intensive operations. And at the same time, there is a realization. So on the one hand, you're relying more and more on space. On the other hand, you see that space getting more complex and more and more uncertain. So you have to re readapt yourself. And this is basically what happened. In fact, it, it's not a creation from yesterday. It's dating back uh, 2008, with the first uh, 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 space command. There's been a joint space command created in France. I won't go into the details, but this is something very. And then, in the end, yes, there's this notion that uh, because we rely on these uh, space assets, we should discourage people from 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 threatening this space. And in a sense, you know, it, you 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 can recognize here the the, the uh, um, uh, willing. Uh, to uh, the will to uh, protect things and, and not create uh, 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 disturbing effects by, by uh, going into more intense uh, um, uh, interactions. 
uh, it's, I'm, I'm not myself from the French government, and I, I noted that there's been a lot of um, uh, time taken to say that these are active, this is a, a, a active defense, as they say, and this and these things. Uh, I don't know what will be the future of that, by the way, uh, in terms of uh, programs and technologies that will be used. That are. Clearly, uh, uh, you know, in French, the notion of deterrence is very much linked to the nuclear thing. That this is something they don't use. A small, uh, the, the, the word that has been used for France has been discouragement. You know, we want to discourage things. And I think this speech was part of this discouraging kit, I would say. Uh, uh, um, and said, so I won't say more about that because I'm not in the inside of the circle. But still, I, I think uh, there is also for France the importance of having the EU taking care of, the, um, of this non arm control, uh, copious oriented things uh, is very important because for, for each of us. Um, you mentioned the traffic uh, and industry. Yes, indeed. Some industry will talk about uh, a space ICAO, you know, the space uh, uh, civil organization for space. It's very much discussed. Uh, this is this notion. Again, here, uh, it, feels, it feels like I think that really, essentially, uh, the situation has not matured yet enough uh, uh, to allow countries to you do do the right balance between their own sovereignty and, and what this kind of organization could do. And this is, I would say, an extreme uh, uh, view, and there is another one which uh, uh, rely more on some national sovereignties. And in between, you have a gray scale. And this is where the, uh, the industry, because the industry, it's, it's paradoxical, but the industry wants who? Because to make, to make profit, to make benefit, to, to, to increase the activity, you need rules. You need to know where you, you will be able to invest and, and to what will be the limit, etc. So for proximity operations, for servicing, for refueling, for moving your satellites, they want rules. They want rules. And, and uh, indeed, uh, today I think this is uh, uh, setting up these rules could be a very good test for our mutual understanding. And uh, again, it's not about arms control. And I will, I think, stop there. You, the dramatic event you mentioned, I'm not sure I am uh, okay. Uh, I hopefully, there won't be any dramatic event, especially for the space station and for the gravity movie uh, that was mentioned <laughs> in the beginning. I hope it won't be a, a reality. I always stop there. Uh, thank you. Um, <laughs> this has been uh, a very good discussion. I appreciate um, the input from not only the panelists, but the crowd. Um, if I could I prompt you all to thank our panelists uh, quickly. Um, round of applause. <laughs> And uh, I note that uh, the next session will be in the original hall because it's a plenary, so we'll all need to migrate over to where we were this morning. So thank you very much to everybody.